So hey, my name is Juan Riaza. Um, so this is a talk defining data pipeline workflows using Apache Airflow. Uh, the slides are already online at, at uh, speakerdeck.com slash Juan Riaza. So who am I? Well, I'm Juan Riaza. I'm a software developer at Idealista. I'm an open source software enthusiast. I'm a Pythonist and Django now. Uh, I've been working with Python uh, for more than 10 years. And I'm trying to tame gophers, if you know about Golang. And I have a curious hobby. I like to reverse engineering uh, mobile applications. That's, uh, I sent another proposal for, uh, for uh, reverse engineering Android applications but it was finally this one, the Airflow one. And then I also have some normal hobbies such as uh, cooking and reading. So I'll give you th uh, 30 seconds uh, just to, to read this comic strip from, uh, for, uh, from XKCD. Perhaps some of you have been already in that situation, right? If you've been uh, building ETLs or data pipelines, it could, they could get really complex and sometimes you don't have that much control about them. So um, this is a bit of story. In the beginning, there was Chrome. I guess when we start, um, um, developing um, ETLs or data pipelines, we always think of Chrome, okay, we have to schedule a certain task at uh, some specific hour, and we need Chrome. So let's, Im let's imagine this uh, imaginary uh, three steps data pipeline, where we pretty much have, uh, the first step is about gather data, the second step is about, it's uh, just a simple ETL. And the last one is about reporting. So uh, they have dependencies between them. That's uh, one thing that we are going to suppose. And we have been checking for how much time, how much time uh, they need, uh, each step needs to, to run. So we, the first step runs at, at uh, 10 p.m. And we know that uh, it, it lasts just one hour. And, and of course, uh, by midnight, the second step is, is ready for uh, consuming the necessary data or dependencies uh, from the first step and so on. Well, uh, that's pretty inefficient, right? Okay, we, we know already how much time uh, it's, we're using at each step. So we could just re reduce the, the spare time between all of those three different steps. And we're happy. Oh, it, run, it runs way faster. But uh, we could get into some problems. So let's imagine that the second step fails. So now we don't know what will happen to the third step. Uh, uh, pretty much worse, let's imagine that uh, the first step takes longer than usual and it's, it overlaps with the second step. So well, we are in the same uh, situation. Uh, we don't have visibility about what has happened at all. So I call it, this, this thing I call cron hustle. Uh, so we have lots of problems if you're using cron, such as managing dependencies. So there might be possible overla overlapping. Failure handling, do we need to retry a step? How do we handle um, failure at each step? Uh, how do, do we notify errors? Do we don't have metrics. Do we have visibility at all about what happens uh, overnight? And well, it will be okay to have unified logs. Um, I have, I, I, I mean, we don't know in which language each step has been developed and it, it would be okay to have unified logs um, from all of them. And I don't know if you have tried uh, uh, to develop a distributed cron. 
I've done it in the past for a young application and it was uh, a nightmare. And if you are uh, working in a um, data engineering role, uh, you perhaps maintain a calendar of batch jobs that needs, that needs to be done. And you're always wondering this, what happens if <coughs> you have so many questions and every day it's a new adventure, pretty much. So, be careful. Well, that was a nice, nice animation. So, overview of what's Apache, Apache Airflow. It's a platform to programmatically, that means that uh, we define everything with code, also scale and monitor workflows. Uh, it's pretty much the glue that binds your data ecosystem together. It's open source, write, written Python, and was started in October uh, 2014 by Mox Bukomain at Airbnb. There, there, there's a lot of uh, really cool projects uh, from that time uh, at Airbnb. You might know as well uh, about Superset. And it's been incubating at uh, Apache Software Foundation uh, since uh, 2016. Now, the project is it's pretty strong. It's uh, 550 contributors and, and Christian. 5,300 comets and over 10,000 stars at GitHub. And well, this was from yesterday. I had to modify the slides <laughs> this morning because they were just celebrating that they had passed that 10,000 stars at GitHub at that mark. So there are lots of companies, really big ones, really big ones that are using already Apache Airflow for uh, on their data teams. So it's not just, mad, it's not just um, a small thing that it's still incubating at, Apache, at, at this Apache Software Foundation. So some, what, what are the typical use cases for Apache Airflow? Um, well, pretty much ETL pipelines, that's the, the, the most common. But machine learning pipelines, predictive data pipelines such as fraud detection, scoring, ranking, classification, recommender systems, or just any general scheduling. Even uh, the DevOps team call this Apache Airflow for uh, lots of related tasks such as DB backups. But pretty much it could be anything. I mean, why not just automate your home's garage door or whatever, it's just a workflow orchestrator. So it could be anything, not just ETLs. So uh, let's uh, check a bit of theory about Apache Airflow. Airflow uses operators as the fundamental unit of abstraction to define tasks. So tasks are equal to operators. And it uses what is called a DAG uh, to define workflows uh, using a set of operators. So DAG is uh, the whole uh, bunch of operators. So what is a DAG? So this is pretty much math. Uh, it's a directed acyclic graph and uh, represents a workflow that's a set of tasks with a dependency structure and each node represents some form of data processing. So if you have studied um, maths at the university, you might know what's already a directed acyclic graph. So it, it does make sense for a, for a workflow, how we, for how we represent a workflow. And this is how it looks like, okay? With Apache Airflow, we have a nice UI. And this is just a simple uh, workflow. It's each uh, box, it's just a, ta an, a, a task or an operator. So we have run this first, run underscore this underscore first, and then we have branching. And we could go uh, one of those four ways. And then we join, whatever. But it could get more complicated. I mean, there, there are, this is, I don't know, this, it might be from uh, the Apache Airflow website or, Airbnb, or some Airbnb slide, but it could, it could get really complex. So let's make, let's make our first uh, DAG. So this, this is going to be uh, the graph, print underscore bus, sleep, and then print underscore Python. This is the simple. This is a, a normal Python file, .py. And 
we just define what's a DAG, we give it a name, comment underscore that, we, we tell what, which is a scale interval, in this case, this one, it runs weekly, on a weekly basis, and then we insta have instance of each operator, in this case, we're using a bus operator and a Python operator. The first one, the bus operator, each, each task has to, needs to, to have a task ID, and the simple one is just a bus command. We just execute echo commit com, hello commit conf. And uh, we then sleep for five seconds. And we have a Python operator that just calls a reference to a Python function. It's up there, print underscore commit. It's just waving hands, hello commit conf. And the last line, that's how we set up the, um, the hierarchy the upstream dependencies. So first it's print underscore bus and sleep, then comes print underscore Python. And then we have a nice UI, um, a website for checking how it looks like. Well, in this case, we just have our brand new commit underscore that. We can check the schedule, the owner, the written task, the last run. But there is more than that. This is a more complex image of a, a, a real, um, a, a real uh, DAG list. In this case, we have KairosDB, GitHub to Redshift, whatever. So we, we can check who's the owner, the written tasks, the rough run, or even if it has been failures or retries. Then this is uh, when we can uh, go uh, in depth to check what this is, which, which is the status and how it does looks like each DAG. We have a graph view. In this case, it's the same. Uh, print underscore bus, sleep, print underscore Python. But it could be more complex. And the, the, a really cool thing is that we could just uh, click on any, any box, any task, actually. So we can, ha we can check the task instance details, we can view the log, we can run it, or we could clear it. That means that we could just rerun each task uh, and caring about dependencies or not. We'll check that, how that, how that works. And then we have the, this tree view, so uh, in this case, each column is it's a whole DAG run. This has, been, this has been running for four weeks, but we could check a more complex. In this case, uh, on the first runs, there's been some failures. So the good thing is that we could clear the state of a failed task and just retry that one without retrying the whole DAG. And then we have what's called a Gantt, Gantt uh, visualization, in this case, it's how much time has it taken to each task to run? Well, we're sleeping for five seconds, so that's take uh, much time. And looks, uh, it looks like print Python takes longer than just printing with bus. Well, makes sense, that makes sense. But in this case, uh, this is a more complex um, DAG, and we can see how, there, how much time uh, that it does take for each task to run. Uh, and the, the cool thing is that we could see how this, um, how, how this looks like over time. So we could check if a task has been increasing their time or if, it, if, if it's taken any longer or it, we could debug uh, the DAG itself. So we have three kinds of operators. We have ac action operators. The, Pretty much we perform an action locally or make a call to an external system uh, to perform another action. Transfer operators, they are just for moving data from one system to another. Sensor operators, uh, we use them for wait for and detect some condition in a source system. So, what are action operators in this case? Well, I have told you already to perform an action such as executing a Python function or just submitting a Spark job. So we could just run a Python function locally, but we could as well, uh, I don't know, perhaps launch a Kubernetes cluster to run our workload or uh, create on the fly 
um, um, an AWS e EML uh, Spark cluster to, to run whatever we want to do with the ETL. And the good thing is that we have lots of built-in operators that are, that are already on the source code of Apache Airflow, such as Valve's operator, Python operator, Docker operator to run a Docker, on, a, a Docker container on the fly, email operator. Um, and we have lots of community contributed ones. Some of, some of them are, for, are, of course, commercial, such as Databricks, you might know them, AWS, and GCP. So we could just automate and integrate all of those systems, such as, do we need to run a query uh, using BigQuery? No problem. Uh, Google has already uh, made a BigQuery operator and works out of the box. We have as well transfer operators to move data between system, uh, well, such as from Hive to MySQL or from S3 to Hive. Uh, so we have some of them built in, such as the Hive to MySQL transfer, S3 to Hive, but as well we have the community contributed ones, uh, such as Databricks, AWS, or GCP. So do we need to move uh, data from S3 to our local file system? We will do it. Sensor operators, the, those trigger them certain tasks in the dependency graph we, when a certain criteria is met. For example, checking for a certain file has become available on, a, on S3 before using it downstream. So we could have a DAG that runs on a daily basis. And it just, we just need an external file to be available at any S3 bucket. So this operator will just check uh, periodically uh, the S3 bucket to check if uh, the necessary S3 file is already available. And then it will just continue with the dependency graph until it gets done. We have, we have lots of built-in as well operators. Hive partition sensor in case we need to, to wait for a, a Hive partition to be available. HTTP sensor, we could even call uh, uh, any external API and check any condition in order to continue with the execution of the DAG, S3 key sensor, of course, SQL sensor, FTP sensor, and of course the community, the usual suspects, the community contributed ones. Um, so let's check, let's do a more advanced or complex example of a DAG. So let's wait for a key on S3, that's a file-like instance, file -like instance on S3 to be present in an S3 bucket. Uh, let's add a new AWS Athena partition. AWS Athena, it's like Presto as a service pretty much. It works on top of S3. Run an AWS glue job and wait until it's done. AWS glue, it's a serverless Spark environment um, uh, from AWS. And notify the data services uh, channel at Microsoft Teams or Slack or whatever you're using at your company. Well, we have already an S3 key sensor that it's built in. Uh, but we could develop as well uh, our own operators. So in this case, I've already done an AWS Athena query operator and an AWS Glue a schedule job operator and sensor, plus uh, a webhook operator to integrate with Microsoft Teams. Uh, there's already a built-in Slack a uh, webhook operator, so you could just notify your data services Slack team about uh, the status of your DAG. And uh, can you see it? Can you see it? Okay. So pretty much uh, we have instance of an S3 key sensor. Uh, we update the Athena uh, partition, then we schedule a glue job. So we schedule the AWS glue job and then we have a sensor to check when it has finished. We send an API call to Amazon, it just starts running the AWS glue job and with the sensor we check if, it, if it's done already or not. And with the uh, S3 key sensor we check if uh, the file exists, okay, it's, uh, if it's uh, really present and then we notify our team. And on the last line, there is this dependency graph. And you might, you might notice that there are some brackets over there. Why? Because 
uh, Apache Airflow has a really cool uh, template system that uses Jinja underneath. So this gets uh, rendered uh, on real time when, on each execution. So we have uh, a variable available uh, such as execution, execution date by default and it gets filled with the, with, uh, the value of the execution date. date. So we, if we have it, if we have uh, this uh, DAG with uh, a weekly schedule, it will just get filled with uh, whatever is necessary. Okay. And the cool part. So imagine we have already developed our, our DAG and what happens if the ETL script has a bug? But we haven't noticed until now, and it's been running for weeks. Okay, so what we could do is just do time traveling. We could travel past in time, and we run only the related tasks downstream. So we don't have to execute again the whole DAG, but just execute the parts of the DAG, the operators that has each, in this case, the, the part of the ETL and without side effects. And well, this action of going back in time and rerunning parts of a DAG, it's, uh, it's called backfilling. And so let's check how everything fits together. Uh, this is the big picture. Uh, so this blue box uh, on the left is uh, how we interact with Apache Airflow. We have the UI, we have a CLI, and we have an experimental REST API. Everything is, is stored on a metadata DB, and we have a scheduler, which schedules, of course, DAEs and tasks whenever it's necessary, and uh, delivers those tasks to the workers. So there is, a, there is only a single point of failure at this moment uh, using Apache Airflow. Um, the scheduler, uh, it's a unique single point of failure. We can replicate the scheduler. But uh, I can tell you it's really hard uh, to get to the higher limit of the scheduler. Uh, companies such as Airbnb have some problems with the scheduler, but they are perhaps managing 8,000 DAGs uh, at the same time, so not a problem for a medium-sized company. So the core components, we have the, the web server, so it pretty much is the Airflow UI. It's, uh, we, it's using Python Flask. The scheduler who is responsible, which is responsible for scheduling jobs. And then we have different uh, kind of executors. So those are the workers. We have local, in this case it's just a Python process, working locally. We have salary, that's the most popular option and it's just um, uh, the de facto way of uh, uh, of uh, a task, a queue based uh, task workers on using Python. But then we have as well Apache Mesos and Kubernetes since a couple of months ago. So we can just run our, our workload on Kubernetes on the fly, on demand. And of course, the metadata, the met metadata database. Uh, and that could be pretty much anything from an SQLite to MySQL to Postgres. Anything that works with SQL Alchemy uh, could be uh, used as a metadata, metadata database. So the, those are the interfaces, uh, the OS3 UI, the Clay, and our Rust API server, which is a bit experimental at this moment, yet. So the, the CLI. Uh, we have lots of different commands, uh, but pretty much it's used to run the core services such as uh, running the web server, the scheduler, to perform some uh, metadata DB operations like, well, a schema, reset the, the state of the, DB, of the DB. To operate on DAGs, we could pause the execution of a DAG, we could trigger the execution of one of them, we could do some backfill, we could perform backfills directly from the CLI. And of course we have lots of useful commands uh, for develop and testing. So the web server UI, uh, it does pretty much search for 
Uh, having a quick look into the AG and triggering, uh, triggering and checking uh, the task, task's progress. Uh, it does have error logging integrated. So the good part is with Airflow, uh, each step could be, or each task or operator could be in a different language. We could have a step which is just bus, another step which is just Python, Golang, or even an external service. But we have the information about what has happened on uh, every step on a unified log uh, that we could that we can check at the uh, web server UI. We can browse the metadata. We will check with that. What's that later? That's XCOM variables and service level agreements, and check for historical historical stats. So um, th that's the first beginner question when uh, anyone starts to use Apache Airflow. How do we move data between, between one task and another? Uh, this is not Apache NIFI or any system like that. So in theory, uh, all data processing and storage should be done in external systems. Okay? Because we can't assume that, the say, that uh, all, this, all, all the operators are going to be executed on the, even on the same machine. Right? So, Airflow has the metadata DB that contains the necessary data uh, for each task for each task uh, to perform to, to be executed uh, con and contains the workflow metadata. We'll check how, how this works. But pretty much the, the metadata DB stores variables that those are st static values, uh, config values, or API, and API keys. And we have this special term that's called XCOM. This is how one task communi communicates with another task. In this case, well, it's a sort for cross communication. And it could be, for example, uh, what's the file name of a file found by a sensor? So ima imagine we have an H3 key sensor. Well, using XCOMs, the next task uh, will know. Uh, what's the name of the sensor that needs to be used, right? But we don't need in, in that, in that, at, that, at that moment to get the whole S3 file locally. So pretty much we know we have a file, that's the path of uh, that file. But we don't move data between tasks. And then we have a connections uh, path to store GDBCs, authentication, um, and so on. So it does have batteries included. That means uh, failure handling and monitoring. So we have retry policies and SLAs, retry policies. So we could have back, uh, a back of time between each, each, each retry. So imagine a system is down, we could wait three seconds, six seconds, and so on. And service level agreements. Uh, in this case, we could have a server level, service level agreement for a DAG and get uh, an alert in, in, the, in case we have uh, already out of the, service levels, of the service level agreement. We have a smarter cron. Why? Because we're using code for uh, developing our DAGs. We can have really complex rules, such as it's an even or odd day. We can even call an external API to know uh, if we need to run a DAG. We could have complex dependencies, such as only run this task if all of uh, the rest of tasks have failed, for example. And then we have the bug fields you know, already, and a really, really uh, feature-rich template system, Jinja. Uh, it's, it's, it uses Jinja underneath, that it's a really, really cool a uh, Python project for uh, managing templates. So let's talk about what's our, what are the best practices. So uh, we have to think about item potency. Uh, this is uh, a key concept while using Apache Airflow. We'll talk about this later. But uh, Apache Airflow allows us to do, for example, to pipe all the logs to a remote storage, such as S3, or uh, G GCS, so in case uh, our Apache Airflow system goes down, we have already all the logs stored somewhere else. We could have back of retries, and 
we need to think about uh, imagine that you have that you could run each task and it 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 doesn't have uh, it's um, if we were to try a task, the results will be the same every time. So that means no side effects. So if we stage transform data, that means imagine that between each task we store uh, the data at an S3 bucket. So if we were to try any task, we don't lose any information at all. So yeah, it's perhaps a waste of uh, resources in terms of storage, but I mean, we are more calm, relaxed, knowing that we could retry any task at any moment and the result is the same. So uh, some recipes, we could generate dynamic DAGs. So well, underneath Apache Airflow checks every pi file in the DAG folder and register any available DAG defined as a global variable. This is a bit of a hack, actually. If you know uh, some Python, um, we are using the global <laughs> variable. So pretty much Apache Airflow uh, checks uh, for any DAG instance on the, glo on the global level. So we could do pretty, pretty much whatever we want. In this case, we're generating on the fly. 10 DAGs, but we could do a DAG from whatever. For example, a variable value that it's stored on the metadata DB, a static, a static file. In, in, in the case of Idealista, we have a, a unique Python file, and then we read a bunch of YAML files, which defines uh, all the necessary data for each source or system that we need to process. It could, but it could be an external source based on connections. You could call a MySQL database to check what needs to be, to be run and generate a, a, a DAG on the fly. Uh, this was pretty much Apache Airflow because I want to talk a bit about data engineering and why I think Apache Airflow uh, empowers data engineers. And I think it's uh, Apache Airflow, it's enabling um, lots of the best practices for data engineers. So does anybody know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I guess so. So uh, this is a really cool slide. Um, I don't know the author at this moment. We, I have a t-tessions and attributions and at the end. So if you could check, you can, you can check. But pretty much, this is what I call, what, what uh, the, the blog post also called the hiring out of order uh, problem. So companies are focused just on hiring data scientists. For what? They, I mean, they, they, they waste 80% of their time just cleaning data or doing stupid tasks and they're pretty much, they pretty much underperform. So we need to think about data literacy collection and infrastructure and that's for what data engineers are for. Pretty much what they're all about. Design, build, and maintain data warehouses. What's a data warehouse? A data warehouse is a place where raw data is transformed, uh, is, is transformed and is stored into queryable curry forms. Uh, so anyone at the company could just consume that data sets, those, those, that data, and enable higher level analytics be it business intelligence, online experimentation, or, or machine learning. And uh, this role, of course, need, uh, we need to master uh, some key skills, such as SQL mastery. So any data engineer needs to master SQL, absolutely. So if English is the language of business, SQL is the language of data. And there are lots of best practices for data engineers, such as load data incrementally. That means, for example, imagine that we have a weekly DAG. We will append data on a table, for example, and load data in a way that we call this really try, we will try or we will run it with any side effects. Process historic data, that's called backfilling. Of course, we need to know about the term of partition. So we have to, part, to have partitions on our ingest data. 
so if we do that, we pretty much enforce the idempotency idempotency constraint. And uh, there's, a, there's a really good phrase that I like, a lot, I like it a lot. So sometimes we can see the forest for the trees. Airflow, uh, the way it's made, if you follow be the best practices from the community, it pretty much empowers data, data engineers and allows us to do what I call functional data engineering. And this is functional data engineering, these ballots. So we must, we, whenever we design a pipeline, a pipeline, we need to think about these ballots every time, every single time. It will be reproducible, that means it's deterministic, same input, same output, pretty simple, and idempotent. So we're running a task for the same date, so it'll always produce the same output. It's, in my case, it's safe to rerun a task from three days ago, no side effect. Future proof, that's mean backfilling and versioning. So data can be repaired by rerunning the new code, either by clearing tasks or doing backfills. If, if the ATL has a bug, no problem. We'll just rerun it. And this is, uh, well, this is a graph uh, from the guys from Robin Hood, from, uh, yeah. It's, it's a blog post, you can check, check it later. So this is the, the typical ETL. And it's a really good representation of which operators do we need to use using Apache Airflow. So we have to extract, we could use a sensor and a transfer. We, could, we have to do a transformation, we use any action and we have to load it, okay? We could use a sensor at the end to check if it's been loaded really for real or not. Well, that's pretty much what I've done, what I've, uh, I've been saying already. So, how uh, we are deploying uh, Airflow? Well, we have a, a role um, at, at, at GitHub and that's how we, how we uh, uh, deploy Airflow at, at Idealista. We, depl we, de we deploy it locally. But there are more options, such as Astronomer. This is, at uh, this moment, uh, the, SAS, the, uh, the SAS for using uh, Airflow. And there was, this was a big hit. Uh, Google Cloud now offers Google Cloud Composer. That's Apache Airflow as a service. So that's, that, that was a really big deal for the Apache Airflow community to know that, that Google, Google uh, is offering uh, Airflow as a service. So how we use it at Idealista? Well, of course, we deploy it via the Ansible role. We have developed lots of plugins and operators internally, some of them for interacting with AWS Glue and Athena, and Microsoft Teams plugin, we don't use Slack, and, uh, and AWS S3 to, F, uh, to FTP sync operator, so we could sync any S3 bucket with an FTP folder. So, if you have any questions, this is the moment. <laughs> Okay, I have a question uh, regarding the scalability of that. So uh, basically what I understood, you can have a single uh, UI just to see like the progress of the tasks. Uh, how does it perform when you have, for example, um, I don't know, hundreds of tasks being run uh, simultaneously? Um, pretty much that's not a problem. So I, I'll tell you, hold a second. Uh, well, here. So. The metadata, the metadata database can be replicated. The web server can be replicated. We could just put a load balancer in front of it, on front of it, and that's okay. So the unique problem is the scheduler. That's the unique problem. Because you could run uh, the workers on uh, any kind of executor, even Kubernetes. But uh, trust me, the scheduler, what does is pretty much check the DAG folder and checks with the metadata database 
uh, to know when, we, when it needs uh, to perform a task or uh, to schedule a DAG. But, I mean, you, re you have to, to, you really need to have a really high load in order to, to be a blocker. So companies such as Airbnb, who runs on demand 8,000 DAGs, well, that's my, they have a problem with the scheduler. But for uh, any medium or big size company that just is, uses it for uh, ETLs and so on, that's not a problem. Thanks. I have a question about Kubernetes. Uh, I've read about the workers and the executors in Kubernetes, but do you have any experience running the other components in Kubernetes, like the scheduler, the metadatabase? No, sorry. No, I'm no, just wondering. I, I guess I guess Cloud Composer is, uh, is <laughs> it's using Kubernetes underneath, but no, I don't. Okay. And the executors, have you tried them? Kubernetes? No. no. I think it's, it's still uh, experimental. I yeah, think. we tried, in my company, we tried in summer, but it was really not mm. working at that time. It was like, it will be available soon. So we're waiting for the moment. I'm curious to know if someone has Good ever enough. tried them. Thanks. Thanks. I think it's, it's useful for, <coughs> for data. It, it's useful for, for, for data engineering, but uh, you can do almost everything. It's for workflows and maybe, a, I don't know, batch or maybe just integrating uh, applications. Yeah, indeed. I mean, uh, I haven't told you about really weird applications of Apache Airflow, but for example, uh, I hope I'm not, I'm not wrong, but Intel uh, uses it for uh, automating Q&A pipelines, and Airbnb uses it for uh, A and B testing. Uh, they are, it's a really heavy modified version of Apache Airflow, and uh, they pretty much uh, created DAG from uh, filling a form, an online form at the web server UI. And I don't know what kind of experiments, of e e e EMB experiments they, they do. But there are lots of crazy uh, kind of uses for Apache Airflow. But well, the most, use, the most uh, common case is just ETLs. Um, I have a question uh, about the, um, the implementation of the or the SaaS the, um, Google have. Um, Google have to solve the scheduler issue or the high availability? No, I don't think so. No, so maybe the, um, um, the resolution maybe could be um, to have an active passive uh, host for even a uh, HA um, solution? To be honest, I don't know. I mean, I know the, the, the Airflow community, it's aware of the status, but it's really, really difficult uh, to get to the limits of the scheduler. I mean, if you're running, of course, at the scale of Airbnb, oh, that's a problem. But uh, for the most common user of Apache Airflow, it's not a problem. Yeah, but, but you need to upgrade the system or shut down machines, you know. Well, in this case, I mean, all, all the uh, data necessary for Airflow to run, it's stored on the metadata DB. Yeah. So if the scheduler goes down, no problem. No problem, you just uh, run another scheduler, it, it will just pick up yeah. with the metadata DB and keep running. Yeah, it's, just, it's I mean, uh, with a, a T passive, uh, yeah, I, I don't know to be to, to be honest. What's the status of that issue at uh, at the pro uh, at the level project of Airflow? I, I don't know if it, there is any issue open that you could have, but I know some some on some meetups they have told about uh, that being a problem, but it's just for really really big scales. Not um, the most common users don't, don't don't hit the scheduler limit. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all.